This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Seven different playoff games across the NBA and the NHL for tonight. We are here to break down every single one of them, breaking down traditional markets, breaking down props, and getting you ready for what should be a fun night in the NBA and the NHL by talking to, of course, Tom Avecchio. Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire. Joined here as mentioned by Tom Avecchio. Check him out on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. Tom, you mentioned coming in that your Islanders, uh, your Rangers, sorry, woof, my bad, uh, your Rangers, <laughs> the biggest sin, the Rangers got a win last night, so you are flying high. I feel like I don't need to ask you how you're doing today, but I guess I will. How you doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, big win for the Rangers, basically in dominating fashion from start to finish over the Devils. I'm not taking anything for granted. As now, it's only one game. There's a lot more to come. And yeah, I'm feeling pretty good today. I'm ready to go. How are you feeling about the series overall? Uh, if it's anything like game one, the Rangers set the tone pretty early that they are the far more experienced team. And while the Devils are supremely talented on offense, they are very young, very inexperienced, and maybe not ready for playoff intensity. Yeah. Well, we're not going to talk Rangers today. We'll talk Islanders, though. Uh, we will loop them in at some point later on today. Four games in the NHL, three in the NBA. We'll dirt, break down all of that action coming up in just a bit. But first, a reminder to make sure you are subscribed to the Covering the Spread podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. More NBA discussion coming up tomorrow. We'll have uh, some UFC as well via Austin Swain. I'll talk some NASCAR, hopefully some Formula One as well, all coming up here later on this week. So make sure you are subscribed to covering the spread wherever you get your podcasts. And while you're there, if you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating as well. The NBA playoffs are here, and you can get in on the action right from first tip with FanDuel. Right now, all customers, all customers, not just new ones, can get a no-sweat same-game parlay every weekend when you bet the NBA playoffs. That's right. Just place a three-plus leg same-game parlay or same-game parlay plus on any, any NBA playoff game, and you'll get bonus bets back if you don't win. There's no better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sportsbook. Head to the FanDuel app and get a no-sweat same-game parlay every weekend of the NBA playoffs. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA, must be 21-plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. Bonus issued is non-withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Massachusetts, hope is here. Gambling helpline ma.org or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support. In New York, one 877 hope and wire text open Y. In Arizona, 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342. In Connecticut, 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash chat. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. In Wyoming and Kansas, 1-800-522-4700 or in uh, Kansas, ksgamblinghealth.com. Louisiana is 1-877-770-STOP. In Maryland, mdgamblinghealth.org. And in West Virginia, go to 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Now let's start things off here in the NBA. And Tom, we've seen each of these games once so far, one game in the series. And I want to ask you how much that matters when you're trying to project out a player's usage, uh, you know, rebounding and stuff like that. How much stock do you put in game one when trying to predict how things will play out in game two? The easy answer is to not overreact about what we see from a player's uh, you know, ineffectiveness or effectiveness. And it also depends on largely who the player is. Uh, you know, a good example I'll, I'll use is someone like Tyrese Maxey on the 76ers, where in game two, he had finished with 32 or 33 points and the 76ers ended with 96 points. I believe it was, they won that game 96 to 85, whatever it was. Tyrese Maxey is a good player. He's someone I'm, I'm high on long-term, but ultimately, you know, he's third or fourth when it comes to offensive usage behind Embiid, Harden. You know, he's third or fourth, depending on what Tobias Harris looks like on a nightly basis. He's scoring a third of the team's points. 
with a team with Embiid and Harden, that's not going to happen every night. Tyrese Maxey hot, had the hot hand. So I don't want to overreact and say, okay, now I love all these Tyrese Maxey props because he's he had this amazing game. It's like, well, he's still not the, just the primary guy for them. So I want to look at this in context and say, okay, yeah, he had a great game. Embiid also had a very quiet game, relatively speaking, for his standards, just because Maxey was so hot. So I don't want to overreact to what I saw. And, and frankly, when the, when big games like this happen, I I almost want to side with the under 100 percent of the time the next game, yeah. and I want to adjust like essentially projections down, you know, 10 percent for that player because if the line's going to be inflated because it's it's steaming up because everyone's betting the over, you know, I, that closing line value could be immense. Are there spots where you will react, like you'll see the way matchups uh, blend together? Are there situations where you do want to be pretty reactive? And I think this the perfect example is probably this playoffs is with the injuries that we've seen. You know, John Moran's questionable. Someone like Tyler Hero for Miami, uh, he broke his hand. He's done. So when someone like Max Struss steps up for the Heat, it's like, okay, now he has to play a role. Like, he's he was okay during the regular season just yeah. with a role he played. But like, now I want to be actively on board with him because of the injuries, because he actually does have to shoot more. So it's not just uh, a player playing well. It's like, okay, we have to – factor in playing well and with the additional playing time due to the change in rotation. Right, exactly. So you mentioned John Morant. Let's dive into the first game here for tonight. That is the Lakers at the Grizzlies. Right now, the Lakers, one-point favorites. Total is 227, and Morant still in question. I think we've seen throughout the past couple years where the Grizzlies' numbers with and without Morant are not as drastic as you may expect, but that is a big thing for player props. So when you look at this game right now, Tom, what do you see for Grizzlies and Lakers? Uh, the first thing would be siding with the under, as I'm going to be continuously taking throughout the playoffs and basically both sports, uh, you know, especially if Morant is out. Like you said, the difference isn't that big for their, you know, offense overall. They're still a very effective uh, defense. They were, you know, top five or top three in the league when it comes to defensive efficiency. Jaron Jackson just won defensive player of the year. Frankly, I, I think that if they're without Morant, they're probably not going to try and push the pace too much. And while they still have some good scores, someone like Desmond Bain, it's probably not going to be in their best interest to get into a track meet back and forth with the Lakers, who are at full health, all things considered. So I would side with the under on that. And then when it comes to player props, everyone's going to be jumping on Desmond Bain because he's a great shooter. He can knock down a lot of shots from downtown. Uh, you know, especially if John Morant is out, he becomes a focal point of their offense. But I think that number is too high as of now. Desmond Bain's up at 23 and a half points, and that is not a spot. And we have to remember that John Morant is still questionable. So right. if Morant were to play and you take the over on Desmond Bain, that is not a spot that I like. So you could wait and maybe his line drops. But as of now, it's the under in the game and it's under on Desmond Bain, 23 and a half points. I know it's tough to get a read on this stuff because the Moran injury is pretty fresh. We haven't gotten a ton of report. We've gotten reporting on it, but not like definitive, hey, leaning towards playing, leaning towards not playing. Do you have a read on that, a lean on whether he'll be able to go or not? No, the the latest report from Sean Sharani is just saying that it, there was no structural damage or whatever it was in his hand, and it's still up in the air. So I haven't seen more than that. Mm-hmm. You know, I would like to think that if he's able to go at at 75 percent, it's the playoffs. He's going to be out there. Right. You know, that that does worry me about his effectiveness. Correct. I would be concerned about him, uh, you know, diving for every rebound or whatever it might be. So that could interest me in some unders under in PRA, that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. Maybe he tries to play more of a facilitator role because he can't shoot. Uh, he doesn't have full strength in his hand, like whatever that might be. I would look to unders on rebounds and overs on assist props. Okay, so check out Moran props once they're up, maybe speculating around whether he'll be fully he- healthy. But for right now, it does sound like there's value on Bain under 23 and a half points, minus 115, and the under for the game at 227. Second game for tonight is the Heat and the Bucks. This spread is six and a half in large part because Giannis and Tetacumpo listed as doubtful for right now. The total is 219 and a half. So the Giannis thing is a big thing. You mentioned Hero as well, uh, not playing for the Heat. So some some balls up in the air here, Tom. What are you seeing in this game as a result of those fluctuations? I think the Heat have a lot of value right now, especially at six and a half, especially what they showed in game one. We know how good the Heat are defensively. They play super slow. I think that this is 
kind of the matchup that they would want where they want to kind of slow things down, uh, turn it into a bit of a scrum, you know, make things less free flowing. Uh, it's tough to read on what the Bucs could potentially look to do on offense. Do they want to try and play their style, which is, you know, getting a lot of three point shots up, uh, having some good offensive flow. The player that I'm most interested in when it comes to the Bucs is Bobby Portis, and he's not listed on anything because we see a very large role for Bobby Portis when Nintendo Kumbo is out of the lineup. He may not be in the starting lineup, but he will 100%, 100% be the sixth man off the bench for the Bucs. We could see Javon Carter in the starting lineup for the Bucs. Now, we will see a, a big increase in usage for both Chris Middleton and Drew Holiday when Nintendo Kumbo is off the court. There's nothing new. We can literally look back over multiple season sample size to see that both of these players – have a lot of offensive usage when Antetokounmpo is off the court. Bobby Portis leads the team in rebounding rate when Antetokounmpo is not on the court. He doesn't have any props listed. We know that Bobby Portis was obviously a big part of their championship run. He can step out and knock down the three. So I love Bobby Portis, PRA, points, rebounds. None of it's listed. Yeah. That's the issue because Antetokounmpo technically still listed as doubtful, not ruled out. So my favorite prop as of now would be Brooke Lopez over six and a half rebounds. And minus 128. And I think this goes in line with kind of my theory of the game, which would be the Heat are going to slow things down and they kind of want to like, you know, hinder the Bucks offense in any way. They want to kind of like muck it up and make it a little bit of a dirty game. And that means a lot of missed shots, a lot of tough shots and, and Lopez over six and a half with no Giannis potentially. He has to be a primary rebounder for them. I know it's tough to set your own line. But going back to Portis, um, what kind of ballpark are you looking at for the PRA bet where you balk, where you're like, okay, they fully account for this. They got me. I'm out. You know, what number is too high for you? For PRA? Um, I know this is tough. I'm putting you right in the yeah. spot. <laughs> um, I would expect it to be, let's see, uh, 25, like somewhere like high, mid to high 20s is probably where I expect it to be. Yeah. If it crossed... 30 sure i probably wouldn't be interested okay so if we could get 20 26 to, to i would say 30 and a half i wouldn't go to 31 so like 30 and a half to 26 is where i'm guessing okay so check out the bobby portis pra bets once they're up uh see what those are whether he's in the lineup or not uh the starting lineup or not sounds like tom is in on portis but if it creeps into the 30s then it sounds like we are out on those portis numbers final game of tonight is the timberwolves and the nuggets and game number one Nuggets blew the Wolves out of the water. Spread here is eight and a half. Total is 223 and a half. What do you see in this final game, Tom? This is probably the hardest game on the slate. I think game one was a combination of two things. One, the Timberwolves are just coming off of the play-in series, you know, playing two games in three days, and the Nuggets are fully rested, and they're they're just waiting at home. And then the second thing would be, the Nuggets are just a better team. They're the number one seed for a reason, and that's yeah. what it comes down to. And ultimately, I think this game is very tough to read because if we see the Nuggets come out and just perform as they are capable of, despite some of their inconsistency to end the season, they're just a better team. Mm -hmm. And seeing them cover eight and a half points would not be a surprise. But also the, the Timberwolves' like desperation factor is obviously there. And ultimately, I think this game is a stay away. You know, yeah. you could tell me that the Nuggets go out there and do what they did last in, in game one and are, are super efficient and they win this game by 15 plus points. And maybe that does lean towards some unders on some players because they don't have to, uh, you know, put a full game worth of effort or whatever it might be. I just don't have a, a true read on it. So I like the other games much more because despite some of the injury concerns, we actually can factor in like Morant being out. Okay. That means Ty Jones is a starting point guard. It, you know, when Ted Kubo's out, Portis steps into a bigger role. We just don't have a lot of that information and the Nuggets, I think, are just ultimately going to win the series like four to one. Right. And the tough thing here is on one hand, the blowout risk should be lower because it's the playoffs, tighter games, et cetera. But also, and you'd think that, okay, every game matters so much. They'll be in there for all four quarters regardless, but also they got to play ahead for the next game. Like if you're down 28 in the fourth quarter or up 28 in the fourth quarter, you want to save your guys for game three. So the blowout risk, although a different dynamic than what it is during the regular season, still very present here too. And I think the spread eight and a half kind of does reflect that of this thing could get kind of gross and we want to be wary of that. Right. And if you are on board with that 
uh, overall mindset, the answer would be under on Anthony Edwards points, under on Carl mm-hmm. Anthony Towns, right. those sorts of things, just because that would play into the Nuggets covering the spread. Timberwolves not putting out their starters, so they can be fresh for game three. Uh, right. you know, putting out their starters in the fourth quarter, so they would be you know ready for game three. Right, so that one's something to stay away, but still some good stuff in the other two g- games on the Wednesday night slate. So should be a fun night across the NBA. But Tom, we have even more games in the NHL. So let's flip over there and talk about the four-game slate in the NHL. Let's begin things off with the more traditional markets. When you look at those, Tom, across these four games, which of those stand out to you? I mean, I love all unders. Literally <laughs> every under I could be on board with. Obviously, there's varying degrees of... Uh, juice on each on each bet uh, initially under on Boston Florida and then LA Edmonton would be my favorites just because the lines are at six and a half it obviously gives you a little bit more leeway compared to five and a half so under on those would be you know my favorites right from the jump just because we get that extra leeway but under five and a half for New York and Carolina is the way things should be playing out as I mentioned you know these are good defensive teams, as I've said, you know, all year, anytime I've been on the show that New York, the Islanders, they're a good defensive team. They're bad on offense. Carolina, they are elite on defense, but at minus 144 is a pretty big line, you know, for some people. So I would say all four unders, but if I have to pick, it would be, uh, it would be Boston and Edmonton, those two games in that order. The Boston game, Boston, Florida, under six and a half is minus 134. The under for the Edmonton game is under six and a half, minus 114. Under for Islanders, Hurricanes, as mentioned, minus 144. But again, value is value. So no it's also five and a half. Yeah, five and a half. Sorry, five and a half there. And then under five and a half for Wild and Stars is minus 128. Didn't mention that one. Are you okay with the under there as well? I am just because, again, both teams are awesome on defense. Um you know, that game was rather interesting in game one. It went to double overtime. The Wild won in double overtime, despite the fact that basically the Stars dominated them in overtime. Uh, more shots, more shot attempts, basically everything you possibly want. They just simply didn't score. So Dallas is a team that can certainly turn up the offense when needed. And like at a certain point, like those goals are going to be start coming through. You can't take 45 shot attempts and not score. Like it's it's going to change. And that has me slightly worried for this game in particular. If we flip back to, if we flip back to Minnesota and uh, you know, the lines at six, maybe that's where I have a ton of interest in the under, you know, and I think this difference between five and a half and six or six and a half is massive in the playoffs more than, you know, at any point in the season, obviously. How much does the franchise revenge game factor in there with the stars having stolen uh, the franchise from Minnesota? I feel like that's got to be at least like we're at 10% towards the under, right? Right. I, I mean, yeah, it didn't factor in the North stars moving from Minnesota to Dallas, but maybe that's more of a factor once they're back in Minnesota. Yeah. Bring them home, stomp them there. You know, <laughs> I like it. I'm into it. Okay. So we're liking a lot of unders for tonight in the NHL uh, for pretty much every single one with the lowest. It sounds like the one you're lowest on is the wild stars under, right. correct? Yes. Okay. Perfect. What else is seen in the traditional markets or is that it there? We're talking player props. The only spot that I would go and, you know, we, I've talked about this before. It's like, we want to maximize value. How do you get the most out of the situation? You know, where can you look on alternate markets? I think it might be with the Islanders in regulation. Okay. And their money line is plus 140. It's totally where it should be. But plus 210 in regulation is such a big line that I don't think, like, I I think the value is almost too much and it's at least worth a sprinkle. So in game one, the Islanders went 0 for 4 in the power play. And while Carolina is great on defense, and I've said before, the Islanders struggle on offense. They're not the best offensive team. 0 for 4 is just obviously an unsustainable rate for literally any, any NHL team, even the ducks and the sharks, these horrible offenses, they still score. So they're bound to have some positive regression. And because they're still so strong on defense, they held the Canes to two goals. Ilya Sorokin is awesome in net for the Isles. You just need one normal goal and one power play goal to fall through. And they're going to be in a spot to win because they're just always solid on defense. As I've said, they're, they're like the Titans. They establish the run. They are a team that is, they want, they want to force teams to play their style, which means it doesn't matter how archaic it may be. 
<laughs> like they want to play their style. And if they do that properly, they're going to win the game. It's going to be ugly. But I think that the 210 line is just too valuable not to have interest in. Yeah, so that's 210 in the 60 minute money line for the Islanders. And then their full game money line is plus 140. So a pretty drastic gap there, understandably so. But it sounds like Tom does see value in the 60 minute money line at plus 210. What about player props, Tom? What are you seeing there at the NHL for tonight? So sticking in that same game, it would be Brock Nelson, the second line center for the Islanders, over two and a half shots. It's plus 148. That's a, a pretty big line. He's the center on the second forward line. He's on the first power play. You know, ultimately this comes down to a lot of, you know, some of this desperation factor. They are down 0-1. They are, you know, weaker compared to the Canes. The Canes are the higher seed. So in when I'm, I'm like projecting this forward, if you look at the game and say, okay, a top six forward who plays on the first forward line ended the game with one or two shots, they're not doing something right. They're not putting themselves in a spot to win. So, be, you know, going down 0-2 is like a death sentence, especially in the NHL. Now, the Isles did get Mac, uh, Matt Barzell back in the game, but he's up on the first forward line, so it does open up some opportunity. And frankly, when it comes to the second forward line, Brock Nelson should be the primary shooter for them. He is very good. So in line with the Isles needing to turn up the offense and also expecting some positive regression, their power play is not going to go 0 for 5, 0 for 10 or whatever. They're going to score. Again, this line of plus 148 is too big for the role that he plays. And you also don't need the positive regression for this market. You just need volume. Exactly. Uh, over and, two and a half shots plus 148. Like you don't need them. You don't need the goals to go in. You just need the shots there. Right. And I don't, they don't need to, right. They don't need to score five goals or 10 goals for this to happen. Like right. his role should be an indication of what this should be. And, you know, frankly, I, I'd play this down probably to like plus 125. Mm hmm. Currently plus 148, Brock Nelson over two and a half shots for the Islanders and Hurricanes game. Which other player props are you eyeing over at FanDuel, Tom? It's going to be going with the best player in the world, Connor McDavid, and it's going to be over three and a half shots. Uh, it is plus 160. Mm -hmm. If you can get his alternate market, which are generally posted later in the day on the FanDuel Sportsbook, if you can get him for five plus shots, that's probably the spot that I would love the most. He had no goals, no assists in game one. And like, this is not something that's going to be happening too often for McDavid They're They are trying to line match him. I, I think that's the goal for the Kings. They have to slow him down in particular, but he can't, uh, you know, be out there not scoring, not performing on offense. He's literally too good. So three and a half is fine. There's obviously a lot of juice on that. So if you can find his alternate market, once they're posted later in the day, five plus is actually going to be my favorite spot. What kind of number are you expecting for five plus? Again, I'm making you set the line here. Tom. It's probably so not going to be. It, it obviously the juice indicates that there's obviously a good expectation that he will cross it. So the juice is not going to, or the the line's not going to be massive because of how much juice there is here. So it's probably only yeah. going to be like plus one twenty somewhere around there for five plus. It's not going to be like plus four hundred, right? Uh, but so like plus one twenty, plus one thirty, somewhere around there. That's where I want ultimately, rather than three and a half. All right. So Connor McDavid and the Oilers Kings game over three and a half shots is minus 160. But check back later on once the alternate markets are up uh, to see what the five plus number would be on McDavid. Check out that plus 120 or so. Tom would like that. But then also Brock Nelson over two and a half shots plus 148 in the Islanders game. That is all that we have here for today. Talking to you, Tom, talking NBA and NHL. Want to thank you, as always, for singing by, breaking down your thoughts on both of these sports. Uh, congratulations on your Rangers win last night. Hockey Tom, just coming up uh, all aces so far between Quinnipiac and that. Uh, enjoy the hockey. Enjoy the basketball for tonight. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks for having me. Check out Tom on Twitter at DFS underscore Tom. And make sure you check out his work over at Number Fire. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. We are back once again tomorrow. More NBA along with some UFC, maybe some NASCAR as well. Should be a fun time as always. We'll talk to you then. Good luck with your bets. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 